If you'd open up your Bibles with me to Psalm 104, our subject today is money, that money matters. That'll be our subject for this week and next. And we've got two points and three uh, scriptures for each point. And the first scripture I want to read together is Psalm 104, Psalm 104. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we ask that you would open our hearts. Holy Spirit, as you inspired this word, now illumine our hearts. Scrape off the self-protective slime that we throw up and fill us with conviction and transform us by your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Psalm 104 is a wonderful declaration about uh, everything God created and how we fit into it. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your th thunders, they took flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. Listen to everything God has given us. Verse 10, you make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You, God, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man and oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees, the high mountains are for the wild goats and the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun to know the time of its setting. You make darkness and it is night and all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. And when the sun rises, they steal away and they lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. Oh Lord, how manifold, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full, full of your creatures. There's the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. They go there in ships, and Leviathan, whom you form to play in it. These all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good, good things. And when you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works who looks on the earth and it trembles and touches the mountains and they smoke. I'll sing to the Lord as long as I live. I'll sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to him for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. 
I'm going to talk this morning and next week about money because money matters. This service is designed to be 75 minutes long. And if you're doing church the right way that you should, when you exit this service, you'll go to one of our ABFs. So your total commitment here on Sunday morning will be three hours. Three hours. During the rest of the week, answer this question. How many hours will you spend earning money? How many hours will you spend spending money? How many hours will you spend either scrolling around on your phone or wandering around the aisles of a store wondering what to spend your money on and looking for a better deal about how to spend your money? How much time do we spend thinking about money, considering money, pondering money, wondering and worrying about money? Money matters just because it takes up so many of the moments of our lives. The subject of money is of great importance, but for some reason, the subject of money is one that we avoid in church because it kind of makes people defensive and nervous and it can tend to make people close off. Money is absolutely integral to the way you live every day, what you eat, what you wear, what you drive, what services you bring into your home, everything. And yet when we start poking at money, we're all tempted to tense up. Why is the subject of money neglected? The subject of money is neglected not because it's unimportant and it doesn't matter. Maybe the subject of money is neglected because it matters so much that when it is uh, dinged upon, we tend to recoil. Pastors feel like, well, the church pays me. I don't want to be hollering at them all the time about money. Church members feel like, well, leave me alone. What I do with my money isn't any of your business. There may be some members of the church board that feel like, oh, we got to figure out a way to pay the bills and we're behind, so I wish the pastor would harangue the church more about money. But even that can be a, a, a push off because it's not so much personal as it is sort of what the church ought to do. We all tend to tense up and be a little defensive when it comes to talking about money. But a healthy pastor, healthy church members, healthy church board, this is how it should work. I love God. I love you. And I know that God is good and that when you walk in God's good ways, this, this is a blessing and a benediction to you that the world doesn't even know about. And so whatever God has said about money in his word, I want you to understand that so that you can walk in it. And for a church to feel like, well, whatever the Bible says and however God directs us, that's how we want to go. So we want to address this subject of money and we'll, uh, we'll do it for two weeks, almost the same as we address singleness for the last two weeks. The first week was a biblical vision for singles, marrieds, and the household of God. The second week was godly guidance. So this week, I just want to give a simple biblical vision two very broad points, and then next week, Lord willing, I'll talk specifically about earning, saving, spending, keeping, giving, all that stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and because money can be tense, I'll give you one lighthearted, hopefully funny story. Three kids talking on the playground, and they're talking because they're capitalist, red-blooded American kids about how much money their parents make. And the first boy says to the other two, my dad's an attorney and he bills by the hour. And I think he charges like $200 for one hour. The second little child, little girl, she says, oh yeah? Well, my mom is an orthodontist <laughs> and she only has to work from breakfast time until lunch and then she's done every day and I heard that if you sit in the chair you have to give her like a thousand dollars to get her to fix your teeth the third kid says oh yeah my dad is the pastor at the church he works 
for one hour on Sunday. <laughs> and he collects so much money that they have to have 10 guys in suits carry it out of the room. <laughs> money is a subject that's neglected for a lot of the wrong reasons, but we shouldn't neglect it because hopefully you'll see this. When we talk about money, we're not really talking about money. Money and what you do with money is an EKG that reveals your heart. It's a spiritual MRI that reveals what your spirit hopes in and what your spirit values. So let's make two simple points in this broad overview about money. Point number one, God created and owns everything. God created and owns everything. He shares it with us. He shares it all with us because he's good and he loves us. That's the first point. God created and owns everything. He shares it all with us because he is good and he loves us. And hopefully you heard that in Psalm 104. God cre- Psalm 104 certainly says this. God created and owns everything. And Psalm 104 also says this. He shares it with us because he is good and he loves us. He created it all. He owns it all. But he shares it all with us because he's good and he loves us. That's what Psalm 104 insists upon over and over again. Psalm 104, verses 27 and 28. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them and they gather it up. God, when you open your hand, we are filled with good things. This is certainly what Psalm 104 says, that God created and owns everything and that he shares it with us because he loves us. Listen to how 1 Chronicles 29 puts it. 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12. David has just uh, uh, collected all this money for the temple, and this is what he says. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and all that is on the earth. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12, both riches and honor come from you, O God, and you are ruler over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And so we thank you, God, and we praise your glorious name. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12 says, in God's hand, it is to give us all that we have. God is the creator of everything, and God is, so to speak, the distributor of all things. He gives it to us. He owns it all, but he shares it all with us. He shares it with us because he's good and he loves us. But the first sentence of that point, that God created and owns everything, there's perhaps not a more important fundamental point of doctrine because it gets right down to heaven and hell. The reason that God has the right to judge body and soul in hell is because God created and owns everything. Fundamental to our Christian doctrine of God and fundamental to our Christian doctrine of the gospel is the belief that God created all things, sustains all things, owns all things, intends all things to work together for his glory. And so he possesses the rights to all things. He has the right to graciously offer salvation and he has the right to judge. The implications of God's ownership are endless and the implications of God's ownership are endlessly personal. You won't ever escape them. From this first point about God creating and owning everything, it certainly would help maybe for me to take 30 seconds and say if you're not a Christian... This topical sermon about how Christians deal with money is sort of like uh, the steps of the dance. And you've got to learn the song first. You have to learn the rhythm, which is the gospel, which is that nobody is saved by buying their way in. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, through his work on the cross. 
We'd love to talk with you more about that. But for those who are saved and in the church, the critical uh, inference to draw, the critical action to take from the fact that God creates and owns everything and shares it with us is this. If God owns everything and he has shared it with me, then I'm not free to do whatever I want, whenever I want with money and possessions. They've been entrusted to me, but not so that I can be Lord and God over everything, but because ultimately God is Lord and God over everything. I can't manage God's resources however I see fit. Rather, I have to consult God's word, I have to consult God's heart, and learn what he says. This is the issue of stewardship. I remember remember being a little kid in Oklahoma with my grandpa, and he put like some $1 bills in my hand, And he said, you go in that store and you can get whatever you want with that money. And I just remember it because it was the first time that I just, like a little Rockefeller, I just walked through the aisles of that store. I I can get whatever I want with this. I also remember, it may have been on the same trip, my grandma writing down like three things that she needed and giving me money and saying, you walk down to that store and you get me those three things and you bring me the change. And I, I walked there and got those things very carefully and brought her the change. The issue here on this first point is too many of us are still like that immature little child in the first story. And we need to grow up and recognize that we're stewards who are accountable to God and get comfortable living in the reality of that second story. Randy Alcorn, best book on money that I've got is by Randy Alcorn, and this is what he says about stewardship. A steward is someone entrusted with another's wealth or property and charged with the responsibility of managing that wealth or property for the owner's best interest. A steward is entrusted with sufficient resources and authority to carry out his responsibilities. Stewardship isn't a subcategory of the Christian life. Stewardship is the Christian life. Because after all, what is stewardship except that God has entrusted to us life, time, talents, money, possessions, family, even his own grace. This is stewardship, the principle of biblical stewardship. Now God God doesn't lay out uh, like exactly what's on the list that we need to buy. This is what's so interesting. God gives us room for our own preferences, our own giftings, our own culture, our own city, whatever it is. But God does want us to check in with him and consult with him as we spend money. And I hope you can see this, church. I hope you believe this. If you would not just run into the store and this is all mine, I can get whatever I want, but you would walk into the store knowing that you've been entrusted with that from God, what you end up purchasing will bring you more joy in the second category than in the first. You, hopefully you've heard me say this enough times that, that you agree with me about it. If you obey God's will, you will never lose out on joy, ever. You will end up with more contentment and more joy if you heed God's will than if you thoughtlessly and sort of typically just run in and only think about your own will with money. Preaching about money isn't really about money. It's about how what we do with money reveals what we believe about God's lordship in our lives and how we trust him, how thankful we are to him. So we have to remove from our minds the notion that anything we have is totally, completely ours. Everything we have is entrusted to us from God. Let's look at one more text in addition to Psalm 104 and 1 Chronicles. Uh, If you can, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. That's about the fifth book in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verses 11 through 20. God is about to send Israel to the store, so to speak. And he wants them to remember why they have money. And so he says in Deuteronomy 8, verse 11, take care lest you forget 
the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built goods and houses to live in, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiplies and all that you have is multiplied, verse 14, then your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and its thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, see that? Beware lest you say in your heart, my power, my might of my own hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to his fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall utterly perish like the nations that the Lord made to perish before you, so you shall perish because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Do you hear the refrain, don't forget, remember. Don't forget, remember. Man, does verse 14 sound so very, uh, so very familiar your heart will be lifted up and you'll forget the Lord your God. You'll become proud and you'll forget God. Beloved, pride is so perilous. And particularly in the area of money, it can lead to a, a hubris that is so hazardous. We need to humble ourselves and remember the Lord our God. And verse 17 sounds a lot like proud, I did it myself, United States of America. Verse 17, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my own hand has gotten me this wealth. This attitude of self-asserting achievement, I'm the reason I have this, so I get to decide what I want to do with it. This may be American, but it isn't godly. The Old Testament and the New Testament are very clear uh, on a couple of things. One, everybody who's able should work hard. The scriptures insist on a good work ethic. You should work hard and you should enjoy the fruits of your labor. The harder you work, the more money you'll bring in. That's sort of the, the biblical picture there and that's a good thing. Those who sit around and are lazy and who can work but refuse to work, the Bible says they shouldn't be incentivized to, to just be lazy, this is something that they should move out of. Yet at the same time, the scripture insists that this attitude, I worked hard, so everything I have is mine and I can do whatever I want with it, that is a godless attitude, not a godly attitude. The biblical attitude insists that I work hard and everything I make has been entrusted to me from God and so I look to him with what I should do with it. That's the only godly way of viewing money. And so there's generosity and compassion and generosity toward those who have less than I do and compassion and, and support of biblical missions and all the rest. That seems to be what verses 17 and 18 are getting at. Verse 17, my power and my might has given me this wealth and so I can do whatever I want with it. The balloon is, the balloon is, I use my strength to work hard and get this money. And the pin is, well, who gave you the strength? The balloon is, I can do whatever I want with this money. And the pin is, well, you belong to God. He made you, he saved you, and all that you have belongs to him. So that's simply our first point in this biblical overview of money is that it's all from God and he shares it all with us because he's good and he loves us. There's only one more point to go. The second point in this biblical vision and overview of money, you'll, you'll, hopefully it'll sound a little bit like the first, but it's modified. Here's the second point. What we do with what God shares with us, what we do with what God shares with us, 
reveals what we believe is good and what we love. What we do with what God shares with us reveals two things. It reveals what we believe to be good and it reveals what we love. Everything's from God and he shares it with us because he's good and he loves us. But what we do with what God shares with us reveals what we believe is good and what we love. It reveals what we believe is good and what we love. Money matters because it reveals. It shows. And I like that word reveals because (laughs) uh, how many times has somebody said something but reality has revealed that what they were saying was not actually what they were going to do or even what they intended or what they really believed. It's revealed by what we actually do. Something is revealed often to be different than what was said. And it's easy to say that we care about what God has said, but if that never shows in the way that we earn, the way that we save, the way that we spend, the way that we give, then, you know, it sort of puts the lie to that. Money is certainly a test and a revealer of what's in our heart. If we we were in uh, Psalm 104, maybe look first at Proverbs 30, which is just the next book after Psalms. Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9, show us that money matters because money is a revealer of what's in the heart. Money matters because money is a revealer of what's in the heart. Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. And the great thing here is it goes from the South Pole to the North. If you're really poor, or if you're really wealthy, or if you're somewhere on the equator, it all reveals where you're at. Proverbs 30, verse 7. Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You see, uh, wealth is a test that reveals the heart. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? That's exactly what Deuteronomy 8 just said. I, with my strength, have done this and I forget God. But the other side, poverty can also be a test. It is a test. Lest I be poor and steal. Lest I, in my anxiety, I break God's commandments to take care of myself. Money's a constant test for us. The only test more constant than the test of wealth is the test of poverty. But there's always a test. Because what we do with our money always shows the heart. And it reveals an accurate assessment of where our heart's at. You know, the... uh, the very, very famous saying of Jesus in Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is not saying, is not saying, uh, if you give more money to Christian causes, your heart will be right with God. But Jesus is saying that how we spend our money reveals where our heart is at, reveals the condition of our heart. Money matters because the Bible is persistent in its insistence that money is an EKG to reveal the heart. And then would you turn in the New Testament to 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's almost to the end of the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 6 And I want to read from verses 17 through 19 in support of this second point that what we do with what God shares with us reveals what we believe is good and what we love. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to be proud, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, 
to be rich in good works and to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What a great set of verses there. See the end? We get to take hold of that which is truly life. You see the middle? We get to do good. We get to be rich in good works. We get to be generous. And you see the beginning that God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Verse 18 says, verse 18 says, if you have riches, you should do good with those riches. First point, God shares everything with us because he is so good. Second point, if we really believe that, then we seek to do godly good with the riches God entrusts to us. And I can't get past the end of verse 17, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I wonder what was in Paul's mind when he put, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I bet he was thinking of a cronut from Benson's Bakery. Just about the best thing you can purchase in Racine. Man, God gives us all things to enjoy. Psalm 104 said he made wine to gladden the heart of man. Miller Brewing Company didn't make it. We, we can certainly turn it illicit in gluttony or in drunkenness, but God provides all things for us to enjoy, it says. That is so good. God provides all things for us to enjoy. And this is, this is again, it, it's, so, it's so fascinating to me that God is omniscient, but God doesn't micromanage our money. There are a lot of detailed laws in the Bible, but next week when I give practical, you know, go godly guidance, there, there's not... There's not a Bible verse where God's like, well, you're allowed to spend 8% of your income on clothes, but half the time you have to shop at Goodwill, and you're allowed to spend 30% of your income on your house, but it can't be nicer than other people's houses. It's like God, God gives all of this bandwidth for us to make choices. And God, it's almost as if God's watching to see, though he is omniscient, what we choose and why we choose it and what that reveals about what we love. He really does give us choices to, uh, to, 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 of what to do with the money. Amy and I celebrated a romantic dinner this week because it was our anniversary. We could have gone to Taco Bell. I'm not, I mean, I hope this doesn't sound flippant. We could have gone to Taco Bell and we could have sent the rest of that money to Kenya. Like, we could have done that. But we went out to a nice dinner. And when we were done, we didn't feel like guilty that we should have sent that. Like there, there's room there. We have giving, we have generosity, we have a date part in our budget. And, you know, we, we, you, there's room there to make those decisions. Because what we do with our money reveals how we use what God has given us to enjoy, whether we can thank him for it in a good conscience that's really this second point, that what we do with what God entrusts to us, what we do with what God shares with us reveals our heart. So acknowledge that what you have is a gift from God and thank him for it. It's so common to complain about what we don't have. It is so uncommon to give thanks to God for what we do have. How, how we speak about what we do and don't have matters because it shows whether we trust God or not. Are we willing to share? Are we willing to give generously? Do we invest in missions? Do we invest in gospel ministry? Does the way we spend money reflect gospel grace? Money matters because, to put it somewhat crassly, the credibility of your Christianity comes through in cash. It's not the only way that it comes through, but it does come through in what you do with money. The most common prayer the most like simple baby prayer. We're like, Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus says, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, your will be done, your kingdom come. Well, think about it. How can you have a genuine Christianity and pray, Father in heaven, your will be done, but don't ever ask me to fund it at all. 
And God, your kingdom come. But God, don't ask me for any of my treasure or any of my time or any of my talent to help bring in your kingdom. Don't, don't, just leave me alone, God. Just do it. This is, this is not the reality of our relationship with God. I saw like a, I don't know, like a goofy cartoon in a Christian magazine once. The offering hymn. The offering hymn was, uh, what is it, that hymn with the line, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And while they're singing the off, while, while he's singing that offering hymn, the guy in the pew is just rifling through his wallet to try to get past the 20s and 10s to find a five or better yet a one to drop in the offering. Like when we say how, 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 how great God's grace is, money's not the only way that we show that, but it is a legitimate way that we show that. Money reveals what we believe to be good. And money reveals what we really love. Do we believe that or not? Money in and of itself doesn't corrupt anybody. The love of money is the danger. And money in and of itself doesn't help anybody at the deepest level of need. Only God's grace in Jesus Christ does that at the deepest level of need. But money matters because it is a vehicle or a means to show what we love and how our relationship with God works out in the reality of life. Money matters, not so much because money matters, but money matters because money is the main way you show what matters to you. And so the calling to the church is to be thankful to God for what he has shared with you and to, to entrust it to him and to not, not, to, to not uh, self, selfishly cling to all of it, but to gladheartedly ask God what he would have you to do with it. Does the way that you deal with money show what God's grace has done in your life? What is, what is richer than God's grace in the gospel? What is richer than God's grace in the gospel? Listen, church, though great our sins and sore our woes, his grace much more aboundeth. His helping love no limit knows our utmost need it soundeth. There is nothing richer and nothing deeper than the grace of God in Christ given to us. And on top of that, on top of that, God gives us cronuts and wine and coffee and and puppies and everything that we enjoy. And so the heart gives thanks to God And then in the utilization of all of those gifts, the heart reflects godly priorities that are riveted to God's grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this, this we ask, that you would change what we love so that we would make and abound in more discerning, more generous, more godly choices. We ask, Lord, that you would transform our hearts so that what we choose, which is based on what we love, would be more godly, more compassionate, more generous, more Christ-like because the love of Christ, Christ's love for us, has so transformed us in the heart. Lord, hear your children and answer their prayer. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand together and respond. My heart is filled with thankfulness. The song ends, so I will give my life, my all, to love and follow him. Let's sing together. My heart is filled.
filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me in his light and wrote his law of righteousness with power upon my heart my heart is filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside who my weaknesses with strength and causes fears to fly whose every promise is enough for every step I take sustaining me with arms of love and crowning me with church as you give your life and your all to follow him know that it is the grace of God that enables you it's the grace of God that forgives you when you fail it is the grace of God that gives you the endurance to continue may the grace of God be with you as you go amen <laughs>